Welcome and thank you for taking the time out to review the gateway area plan, form-based code, and building and massing. Hi, and welcome to gateway area plan, form-based code, and building massing. I'm David Loy, I'm the Director of Community Development with the City of Arcata, and I invite you to uh, participate in the gateway plan ongoing engagements to uh, conduct this important planning work for the city of Arcata. I'd like to also encourage you to reach out to me or our senior planner, Dilo Freitas, if you have any follow-up questions resulting from this meeting, or if you're interested in learning how to engage in further detail with us. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you some material that we've been working on to help explain how the uh, zoning work that we're doing, the high level policy work that we're doing, and the form-based code can all be used to create an environment in the city of Arcata that both addresses our future uh, development and growth needs, as well as respecting the values and aesthetics that we all have for the city of Arcata. I'm going to start with a high level overview of the gateway area plan boundaries. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, the boundaries start in the south on Samoa Boulevard. Uh, they run out and catch some of the commercial properties and residential properties uh, in between Fifth Street and Samoa. And then the boundary zigzags a little bit to get over to K Street, up Alliance, comes back out O Street, and then out Q Street. It's about 138 acres of land that includes a variety of different uses currently that we'll talk about. Uh, and what we're really gonna be focusing in on this particular program is uh, how future development can fit within the existing bounds of current development and how it could be limited based on these form-based codes that we we'll provide. Right now, the zoning in the city of Arcata in this area includes areas that are zoned light industrial, heavy industrial, this darker pink. Uh, we have some residential high density properties, some residential medium density properties, as well as some commercial, and finally some residential low. So it's a real mix of different uh, zoning districts currently in this, uh, this area. Uh, but the one thing that all of this area has in common is that there's a lot of redevelopment potential uh, within many of the parcels that are included in this area. Within this current zoning, you can develop out a you know, certain building elevation. Uh, there are standards that limit you to uh, the floor area ratios, the, the massing that, that's allowed within those districts, there are setbacks and various other requirements. One way to visualize these is through these glass boxes. Uh, the glass boxes you see in the screen here, a transparent uh, uh, image of the maximum height combined with the setback requirements. So you can see within each of these different districts, there are uh, various heights allowed for and various densities of development allowed for. Uh, within these glass boxes, they show the maximum build out under current zoning based just on those two parameters, height and setback. There are other standards that we can look at that address reducing the footprint of future development even further within this current zoning district. So I just wanna take a quick look at what the building elevations are that are allowed right now. In general, you can build a four-story building within each of these districts. On the industrial limited, you can go up to 45 feet 45 feet in the residential high density district and in the industrial general, it says minimum of 45, but it's up to the decision maker. So it could be greater than 45 feet. Commercial districts, you can go 35 and 38 feet with a density bonus in residential low density or 38 feet in the uh, residential medium density. So right now you can see there's a range of different uh, building heights that are allowed for in these districts, but despite those upper limits, uh, very few projects have really maxed out these building uh, envelopes. And again, in part, that's related to market conditions, but in part, it's related to the other standards that we have in our zoning codes. So I want to keep this in mind that the zoning code is built based on 
both these maximum building heights uh, as well as these other standards. And we'll come back to that theme many times throughout this presentation. Right here, I'm showing you the Arcata Gateway area, uh, these glass boxes, if you will, uh, as they are currently proposed. Now, recall the Gateway Area Plan is in draft form right now, and so this is all subject to uh, the discretion of the decision makers and input from you. So I want you to continue to participate and provide us feedback on these. I'm showing you here the four districts that are proposed in the Gateway Area Plan. There's the Barrel District in this pink color, Gateway Hub, or the center part in this blue color. Gateway Corridor, which runs along Samoa and K Streets. And then the Gateway Neighborhood. Gateway Neighborhood is more of a transition zone. And you can see compared to these glass boxes in the background, Gateway Neighborhood provides for uh, lower development potential than the Gateway Hub, for example. So what's currently proposed? Well, in the Barrel District, uh, eight stories maximum with a maximum of 90 feet. In the hub, you have 80 feet maximum that would accommodate seven story buildings. Corridor, you can build up to six stories with a 70 foot maximum and the transition 60 feet with five story max uh, on these neighborhood, gateway neighborhood. But what proportion of those properties could actually build out or will actually build out at those densities? I think one of the things that has been a big concern for many community members is the thought of this entire area looking like this glass box vision here. Every property built out to a maximum build out uh, that really maximizes the bulk and mass. That's not a realistic expectation for development within this area. And it's not a realistic expectation of how the codes that would be implemented to further regulate uh, development beyond just setback and maximum building height. So to take a closer look at this, um, we used a couple of different strategies. One, you'll see some of these glass boxes have buildings inside of them that are not real buildings. Um, all of these white buildings are three-dimensional representations of actual buildings within this plan area. And so you might see some buildings that you're familiar with. Maybe you see the building that you live in or work in. Then you'll see these other buildings that, that are not in the plan area right now. Uh, this is Bud's mini storage right here. We've got a rough model built for Bud's mini storage showing uh, some features there. There's the Amerigas parcel, car wash parcel. And so we're going to use these to visualize how the form-based code can further refine what the development potential is on these sites that goes to limit these to more than just these glass boxes. So just summarizing real quick, you know, current zoning uh, that we have in place right now allows for 45 foot tall buildings in general. You can build a four story building in most of the plan area. Uh, maximum building height is much taller in general than what the plan allows for. And they're uh, much, uh, that the, the taller buildings in the draft plan uh, are higher than what's currently proposed. And then finally, the form-based code design standards will further limit uh, that future development. So we're not anticipating a development potential that looks like these glass box visions. So let's dig into the design process a little bit to understand how those controls really can affect uh, further limitations on development beyond these glass boxes. I'm going to look into uh, the car wash parcel here and use this as an example for many different uh, insights into how form-based code can be used to further refine development. You can see we have this rough model that is housed within the glass box, the glass box being somewhat transparent. And then the model, this rough model being, uh, you know, uh, darker comprised of different uh, building floors there. We also uh, went beyond that with some of these parcels and added a more refined uh, model. This more refined model takes a look at how uh, building setbacks on the ground floor, on upper floors, and uh, how articulation of the buildings could further uh, enhance both the, uh, the aesthetics of them and also reduce the impacts of these, these new proposed buildings. And I wanna be real clear at this point that None of these models, none of the glass boxes are fixed. These are just representational so that we can start to understand how the code would interact 
None of these are proposed actual buildings. And so I don't want anybody to look at this and think that we've got a, a vision for, you know, what buildings might actually be built out right now. These are simply models to help us understand how these building forms would impact uh, on-site and off-site uh, existing and future builds. So again, looking at the car wash parcel, if we zoom in on an aerial image of it, you can see the car wash and then on the other side of the block, the mini storage. This particular property is all in one ownership. Uh, you can see that the creek is daylighted through a portion of the property, but not all the way through. And so this property reflects pretty significant potential for redevelopment in the future. We're going to take a look at how that might uh, look, how it might impact other buildings around it. Under current zoning, there's a total uh, glass box volume that is much, much larger than the actual build out volume. Again, here's the car wash on the right of the screen and the mini storages on to the left of the screen. And in fact, you can look throughout the, the zoomed in portion of this district and see that none of the existing buildings are built out to that full potential. Uh, there's a total elevation of 45 feet that could be built out to. And looking into the future, uh, with the proposal and this rough model, that would bring us up to a total of 70 feet build out potential. This rough model encompasses a portion of the property. You can see the creek is still, the daylighted portion of the creek is still there, uh, rep represented by this green area here. And in this particular build, there are five stories with that upper floor setback like we talked about. Because these stories are very tall, you're only getting five within the 70 feet. This district actually currently allows in the draft for six. So you can imagine this being a five or a six story building. The more refined model took advantage of uh, some design principles that would help uh, ameliorate impacts. And so you're seeing as we step down from the glass box to the rough model to a refined model, you're starting to see how we can further restrict uh, the impact of the development, the bulk and mass, the way that it feels onto the street, the way that it affects other com community, um, existing community amenities uh, like the creek, uh, the way that it will impact adjacent neighbors. And so this is uh, to help us understand how we can further refine with form-based code. You can see in this uh, image, we have a 50 foot, 60 foot building. Now the 60 foot is further to the south of the parcels, which would limit the shading impacts of the project. So we can use these kinds of concepts as standards in the form base code to ameliorate those impacts. You can see upper floor setbacks, as we've discussed about three stories, as well as lower floor setbacks. Some of these can be attributed or used for uh, public purposes. You can see uh, some attempt to show how articulation of the building form could affect the massing and reduce the, the sense of the building. And in addition, we have some site specific standards that might be applied on particular sites. This car wash site, for example, has real potential to allow for daylighting of a creek. And so we've shown that here. So there's no development on that. So what are the elements of the form-based code that we've just looked at here? For one, there's placement on the street. There's the building form, the bulk and massing of it, where it sits on the lot. What are the setbacks? We can affect all of those with this form-based code approach. There's also the building standards. What do we want the buildings to look like? What types of architectural features? How much uh, window opening? How much glazing? Where do we want the doors? How do we want placement of uh, you know, those, those public intersections between the private and the public space? how much landscaping and so on and so forth. And then we can also address site design standards, including landscaping, you know, these uh, publicly accessible private open spaces that would be secured through easements and other uh, features of the development that really reflect onto the public uh, uh, right of way. Uh, you can learn more about this if you'd like. If you search the uh, YouTube and search Arcata form based code, we've got uh, some great videos that are primers for this. So moving back to our car wash parcel to uh, dig a little deeper into design, we've got this framework now. Okay, so maybe the form-based code only goes so far as to establish this framework, upper floor setbacks and these sorts of things, uh, ideas around bulk and massing. We would then, for projects of this scale and nature, uh, leave it to the architect's creativity to bring forward a design that really enhances the site and enhances the public view. 
And so here's an example where that framework could house something that looks similar to this. Uh, this very nice, aesthetically pleasing design uh, could be incorporated onto the site within that framework. And it's a way of understanding how that framework can then lend to development of projects that really enhance the area. The form-based code could even go as far as defining some of these features, maybe where the uh, balconies land, where the uh, openings, uh, how, how frequent the openings should be for, you know, for uh, public spaces. Um, this particular site is, uh, is you know, filled up with basically five-story buildings and four-story buildings, and we could define all of that. Um, obviously, the more definition we give to the code, the more detail there is, the more uh, time and energy and money we'll have to put into that code. But if that's the direction this community wants to go to ensure that it knows uh, what development is going to come out of this, um, that is an option. Leaving the framework a little bit more vague, uh, maybe a little bit more detailed than this, but a little bit more vague uh, will get us to a code more quickly and it will allow for more flexibility in design. Leave the architects uh, to do their work and uh, create these, these really nuanced spaces. So again, just recapping, uh, maximum height and building setbacks are sort of the first layer of design. There are several more that can be implemented. The form-based code would further refine setting boundaries on development, including not only the upper floor setbacks, but up to and including how much glazing is on the frontage, uh, you know, what those uh, street amenities would be, where the public accessible private open space would be. And the form-based code provides standards on a range of facets for development that go beyond that, including potentially street trees and et cetera. Okay, so now I want to jump into how the design standards will put additional limitations on height and how that impacts the, uh, the community around these new builds. They impact shading, street impacts, massing, and design, among a whole host of other features. We're going to go back and take a look at the car wash, now looking at it from the aerial image, uh, looking west-southwest. And you can see 10th Street there in the foreground running out to the bottoms. And what we're going to evaluate here is impacts on shading. So here's our model. We're going to zoom in a little bit. This is, again, our rough model. You can see the glass boxes and the rough model inside the, the car wash parcel there. Uh, you can see some solar shading in the, the background GIS there. But we really want to use the GIS tools to their maximum potential. Uh, the tools allow us to evaluate different models and what the shading impacts would be. And so I've run a couple of different scenarios I'm gonna share with you now. This is that same model with the shadowing for December 20th. And it's showing us areas that are in shade for more than two hours during the periods from nine in the morning until four in the afternoon. As we all know, the winter, uh, here on the North Coast is typically a darker time of year, uh, cloudy, uh, rainy, <clears throat> but solar access is still important. Uh, because of this, we want to make sure that we design appropriately and ensure that the, the new designs don't unduly cachet on other buildings. This two hours of shading is sort of a standard in the industry, uh, and the nine to four is a slightly larger window than is typical. <clears throat> What you can see from this model, though, is that the shadow comes all the way across the street. It encompasses these existing buildings. These are uh, a couple of the, the multifamily residential units on the Lord House property. And it goes quite a bit into the parking lot for uh, German Motors here. So that's pretty intense shading on December 20th. Uh, by February 20th, the two-hour shadow uh, cast is to about 10 feet within the prop front property lines, the southern property lines of those properties we've looked at before. And so recognizing that the as we get closer to the summer and the sun gets higher in the sky, you're going to have fewer and fewer impacts. So the December 20th is kind of like worst case scenario. We're starting to see those resolved by February in this uh, real rough model that we've got. Well, what does the, the more refined um, model look like? And, and again, I'm not suggesting that these standards be the standards that we adopt, but I'm showing you how if you adopt standards 
that further refine uh, the development potential, how they can have an impact on these, these impacts. So here's December 20th with the refine model. You recall the shadow was up on top of the rooftops of those existing one-story buildings. Now it does cast onto the buildings, but not all the way up to the rooftops. Again, this is two hours of shading on December 20th. By February, two hours of shading is all the way out to the street and there's no impact on the rooftops. And so the vast majority of the year, there's no shading uh, across the street to the other existing development or even proposed development on the German Motors uh, back parking lot, if that's to develop in the future. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Well, two hours of shading, uh, you know, that's, that's one threshold, but maybe your threshold is lower. GIS model can also show us what hourly shading looks like. And so here you're looking at that same refined model that we're working with that could be the result of a form-based code. And you see these uh, pools of shadows getting progressively lighter, representing fewer and fewer hours of shading extending outward from the, the building. And this is in February, so we're looking at the area where by February, uh, this building had no impact on the two hour model. You can see that it does shade the, the adjacent parcels to some extent. So how much, we wanna know how much to that extent. This area right here is 45 minutes. There, you're up to 60 minutes. So you're almost off the property before you get to an hour. And it's five hours in the middle of the street. There are many places within the city of Arcade, I think you'll find that you get five hours of shading in the middle of the street uh, with any sized building. But this uh, shows how you can ameliorate the impacts to other property owners, if not to the street. So again, just recapping, uh, the form-based code can refine what you're seeing in the jewel box. It can further refine what you're seeing in the rough model. And the form-based code can really address, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, impacts that we're all concerned about. Those decisions will be adopted by the council. And so to the concerns that we're going to adopt uh, uh, some kind of code that would have undue impacts on the adjacent uh, neighbors, I just want to remind us all is that the council is uh, in charge of that process and um, is very interested in hearing from you. And so if you have particular ideas, they want to hear about them. Uh, the Planning Commission also likewise is an important recommending body to the council on this, and they want to hear your thoughts too. Just wanted to close uh, this portion of it by showing you what that building looks like by April. By April, yeah, you're going to get shadowing uh, right adjacent to the building. Uh, right underneath it, you're going to, uh, you know, during the daytime, you're going to have some some shading that you'll um, have to walk through if you're walking on the uh, south side of the street. But for the most part, you've resolved all the impacts to even the street um, as well as adjacent neighbors. Okay, so just to recap, form-based code can refine those development uh, uh, standards so that they're appropriate to the setting. Uh, and the maximum building height can be further limited by these standards. Limited uh, limitations imposed to these standards can address many of the things that we're concerned about in larger stature buildings in our community. Okay, in light of these design standards, how many properties are likely to build out taller than five stories? I've seen some commentary in the public forum that you know we're going to have five, six, seven, eight story buildings all throughout the uh, the entire gateway area. That's just unrealistic uh, for a couple of reasons. First, I want to address uh, some some market factors that are driving those trends, and then I also want to look at how the standards that we adopt into this form based code can really change how many sites would be subject to the five stories so that, that we have a sense for how making good decisions about certain areas in the future uh, will help to ameliorate those concerns. Okay, so in terms of the market forces, uh, I want to reflect back on a couple of maps that are in the draft plan right now. To the right, you see the, the districts. There's the barrel district in yellow, the gateway hub in blue, corridor in orange, and the neighborhood in brown showing you both the maximum stories and the maximum height that developments can build out to currently based on the draft plan. On the left, you have the sites that are identified as opportunity sites within the gateway area plan. These are sites that have a lot of potential for future development and are uh, largely viewed as uh, the areas that are going to provide them the majority of future development over the next 20 to 50 years uh, in this plan. 
I looked at these opportunity sites and broke them into sites that are vacant and ready to develop as soon as this plan is adopted. These three sites could probably develop, you know, uh, immediately. There are some sites that have a few constraints. They're going to take a little bit longer, but within the first, say, you know, three to five years, they'll probably be ready for development as well. A couple of sites there. And then there are some sites that have, you know, more constraints, but there's high potential there. And the property owners are interested and engaged in, in wanting to uh, develop these sites out. So from a market standpoint, these sites are the ones that are the most ready to go. There are economic factors that inhibit someone making the decision for tearing down an existing building and building a new one, even if that new one could produ produce marginally higher rates of return. Within those sites, we have 36 acres. So of the 183 acres or so, there's 36 acres that run between 1,400 and 1,800 units uh, with, with that amount of development potential. So the the proposition I'm making here is that most of the sites, if you wanted to know how many sites are going to develop out with those taller stature buildings, most of the sites are going to be late to market. If you have a site that's already got development on it, they're not likely to redevelop as quickly as these sites are. There are only so much uh, units that are going to be absorbed in any given year. And once those units are on the market, there's a disincentive for others to, to develop their site. So there are some market forces that drive which of these sites develop out to you know, larger stature buildings. The vast majority of the area under this uh, analysis is going to remain just as it is today in current uses as they are today. Let's switch uh, gears a little bit and look at how the form-based code can be used to address this question. We're looking again at the uh, Samoa and K Street corridor. So this is this this greenish uh, color the, is in the um, corridor district, and this pinkish color is in the gateway neighborhood. Um, we're looking at some models that were developed for the uh, Marigas site, the Bud's Mini Storage, and the former St. Benny's here. And then you can see, again, in white, the existing buildings in this area, along with the parcel lines around those properties. So before we answer the question, how many of these properties are likely to develop out at five stories or greater? I want to look at some of the principles that we talked about with the form-based code for shading, because we would apply those in these areas to ensure that adjacent neighbors don't get unduly shaded by this new development. So taking a look at that, uh, if you imagine that this outer box is the parcel boundaries, this blue box here is the parcel boundaries. Before you start a development that's going to be five stories tall, you're going to want some a uh, pretty significant setback. So let's put a 20 foot setback on the ground level. Before you start building, you have to have at least 20 feet setback. We've talked about upper floor setbacks. I think it's appropriate to evaluate 20 feet as an upper floor setback. So you might be able to build three floors, this blue box here that's inside the lighter blue box. Might be able to build three floors with a 20 foot setback. And then to build to the fourth and fifth floor, you'd have to have another 20 foot setback. So greater than three floors, 20 and 20 or 40 feet back. The minimum building distance is 30 feet we're using here. Certainly unique designs could be created that have uh, you know, 20 foot or maybe 10 foot wide building footprints, but we're gonna anticipate under this scenario that 30 feet is sort of the minimum width that you would want for habitable space. And then we're gonna put some setbacks on the backside too, 10 and 10. So you can see this is in the north-south axis because the sun is in the south and our shading is cast to the north. So we're gonna have a bigger setback on the north and a smaller setback on the south. Using these parameters, we basically end up with a 90 foot minimum north-south axis. If you have less than 90 feet, you're compromising either the setback or this minimum building footprint. So using that to evaluate the parcels that were in that image that I showed you previously, we can tell which of these parcels uh, meet that 90 foot setback or that, that 90 foot uh, access requirement, excuse me. Evaluating those, these parcels here, they don't have 90 feet minimum, so they can't be developed with five story buildings under this scenario. Just not gonna happen with that, that standard set. These sites here, uh, it's an open question. It depends on what we do with the east-west access setbacks. And so we'll come back to that. 
But these properties here, yeah, you can, you can build those uh, with larger stature buildings because there's plenty of room to accommodate the setbacks that we would give both on the north-south axis as well as on the east-west axis. So let's come back to these questionable uh, properties. We want to know, well, are these going to get developed or not? And the answer is it depends on how aggressive the uh, decisions are made about how much development we want development we want in these given areas. And we can tune this in for certain areas if we want to have more development. And if certain areas we want to have less development, we can fine tune those with that form-based code. Let me explain what I mean here. If we have building setbacks like we have in the downtown with zero lot line setbacks between adjacent buildings, between adjacent properties, as you see here, with no separation between buildings, the property line goes right between buildings that are smashed right up against one another. In that kind of scenario, then yeah, these sites would be completely developable. You could have north-south access uh, setbacks that ameliorate impacts to the neighbors to the north, and you could have wall-to-wall -wall, uh, adjacent uh, developments on the east-west access, and you'd be able to develop all of those properties. So that's a choice. Zero lot line setback is a choice, which would increase the development potential and allow for larger stature buildings on these sites. What if we wanted to have some separation? We're going to allow for zero lot line setback on one side. So uh, in this diagram, on the low end, you have zero lot line. But we want to ensure that there's some clear space, some, some breathing room between buildings on the other side. So each building is allowed to be offset with a zero lot line setback on one side and a slightly larger setback on the other. What would happen to these properties then? Well, the answer is maybe. It depends on how wide you want that separation distance and how wide these parcels are. So some of them might be able to be developed and some of them probably wouldn't under this scenario. And then sort of the third option would be to have a, a greater setback. So in this situation, you have setbacks from each building type on both sides of the property, and maybe you want to have large setbacks and ensure that those large setbacks are used for other purposes. In this case, the answer is no. None of these properties would be developable. Uh, what you're seeing in the photo above here is a setback that's being used for outdoor uh, seating and dining. Uh, what you might see that used for in this neighborhood setting is more for uh, yard space. And so, you know, those, those are the kinds of decisions that can be made in the form-based code that would go from one end of the spectrum, creating a lot more development potential and allowing for larger buildings, even, even including those setbacks on the north-south axis, to a lower development potential where these sites would be able to potentially develop to three to four stories, even though the district allows them to develop to five, those particular site conditions would only allow them to develop to three or four. So what do we need to balance when we're considering building height? The you know, relationship between building height and public amenities, the number of parking spaces that we have, uh, the amount of area we can dedicate to alternative transportation, all of these things are based on how much land we dedicate to which purpose. And so I wanna explore the relationship between building height and unit count and look at how that affects the open space available on properties. Just take one view, a couple of parameters, and look at how they interact. Okay, so this table shows a total number of units that could be developed on these opportunity sites. There's 60 acres in these opportunity sites. If we were allowing for a total of a range between, you know, four to six to eight story buildings based on a proportion of four, six, and eight-story buildings. So in this first line, you can see there's 100% four-story buildings, no six, and no eight. On this bottom line, it's 100% eight-story buildings. I want to emphasize here, this is just a model to help us understand how building elevation and proportion of mix of building elevations affects unit count. No one is proposing that there be eight-story buildings throughout the district certainly not throughout the entire gateway area. And so this is for modeling purposes only. We also wanted to look at what happens if you limit it to six stories. So instead of allowing for eight stories in the barrel district as currently allowed, what if we said six stories was the max in the barrel district? 100% four stories, 100% six stories. 
So the proportions changing. And so these proportions are the same with four, and four, six, and eight as they are with four, five, and six. And so we can compare the totals. If you look at this middle category, which is a pretty likely outcome, you'll have a lot of four-story buildings, quite a few six, and not so many eight stories, in particular since the eight-story buildings are only currently proposed in the barrel district. You can see from this that allowing for four, six, and eight-story buildings does provide for more units, uh, 3,841 compared to 3,555. Now, I know the first thing you may be thinking to yourself was, that's not a very big difference. So why all the consternation over eight stories versus some lower number? I think that's a really good question that we need to explore, and that's part of the reason why we're looking at this. You might also be looking at the four-story unit count 100% four stories provides 3,269 units in this model. Now this model fixed for things like, uh, you know, average unit size and so on and so forth. So these are all uh, relative to each other. And so you might be thinking to yourself, well, 3,200 versus 3,500, that's a pretty good trade off too. And so why are we talking about larger footprints, larger buildings? We should be just focusing on four stories and moving forward. So the reason why we're exploring this is to answer that question. I wanted to look at the lot coverage and community open space that's related to getting to those, those unit counts. And so fixing for unit count, in this case, 44 units on a 30,000 square foot site, we're gonna vary the uh, building footprint based on the number of floors here in this exercise. And so you'll see in this plan, gray is going to reflect building, so lot coverage is gray. Open space is going to be green. Right now, you see the parcel that we're going to be playing with here in green. And black gives you a reference for the sidewalk, and we're going to be looking at site plan view and build and elevation. So there's going to be the side view, and there's going to be the top view of these buildings in these different scenarios. So looking at a three-story building, Three-story building in order to hit 44 units on a 30,000 square foot lot with the parameters that we used takes up 100% of the lot coverage. There's almost zero open space in this model. And so you can get that 44 units on a 30,000 square foot site by covering the entire thing. What happens if we look at a four-story building? Four-story building can cover 74% of the lot leaving that 26% open for other uses and still accomplish the 44 units on the 30,000 square foot site. You have about 8,000 square feet of open space here. Looking at a five-story building, you only have 59% of the lot covered. The remainder of that lot is open for other uses, still getting the 44 units on that 30,000 square foot lot. So when I go back to the example of the, the model where it showed that you can get just about the same number of units, all of the things being equal out of 100% four stories versus a mix of four, six, and eight, or a mix of four, five, and six, that is true. You can get about the same number of housing units. The question that you have to ask then next is how much of that space in this area do I want to dedicate to getting those housing units? So here's where we need to uh, weigh the policy decisions against providing more housing, providing more open space, or providing other amenities within the, the community. Now, reflect this uh, green space here that's on this five-story building. Some of that could be dedicated to uh, the uses on that site. So you might have some private recreation space for the users of that site. But one of the core features of this uh, program is that uh, these, these new developments will also contribute to the public realm. And so we'd be able to get a tot lot or maybe a nice, uh, you know, corner parklet or a seating area or, you know, expanded sidewalks. So these kinds of public amenities can come out of allowing for taller buildings that free up more of the site for other uses. I want to transition into a little bit more of a... Um, uh, nuanced and, and uh, higher level conceptual financial model that looks at the uh, relationship between um, unit density 
and the feasibility of building these projects to begin with, because those two things are related as well. If we said, well, we want to go with four story buildings, we want to go with larger site plans, uh, larger sites that are dedicated to uh, the area, that's going to inhibit the ability for developers to build units. And the units is what make these projects pencil. So before we, you know, go off on the idea of saying, well, let's let's just have a smaller building footprint and lower unit count, and we'd be happy with that. You have to ask the question, is it financially feasible? Okay, don't panic. I'm going to explain this graphic. This shows a conceptual model for when a development pencils out. And so this is going to be relative. This could this model could be applied to a single family standalone. This could be applied to a duplex. It could be applied to a walk up um, and a mid rise building or a high rise building. All of those run on the same conceptual principles that I'm going to explain to you using this uh, this graphic. On this axis, we're looking at the cost per dwelling. So this is how much it costs to produce each dwelling unit in any of those different kinds of scenarios. On the bottom here, you have density. It's the number of units that are allowed in the code per, uh, you know, per area of land. You typically use acres in our codes. What you're seeing in this gray line is the average cost per unit. So some units are going to be bigger and cost more. Some units are going to be smaller and cost less. But that's the average cost per unit <clears throat> for that building type. This orange line is always going to be higher than the average cost per unit because it's basically taking the incremental cost of adding new units called the marginal cost. So every time you add a new unit, you're adding new margin to the cost of the development. And this dashed line is the market price. This is the price that you would get either for rent or for sale of the unit. The marginal costs will increase as density goes up. As the marginal cost increases, it will at some point hit what is considered the market price. That market price cross where the marginal cost crosses the market price is referred to as the optimal density. This is the density at which the project is penciling best. It's making the most return on the investment. It makes the most sense for the developer to do it. When you get above that market price, when the marginal cost, the cost to build a unit gets above the market price, then you're starting to lose returns. You're getting diminishing returns on that marginal cost investment. If your marginal cost doesn't get into this gray box, this is sort of the profitability zone. This is the price of land that it costs to do the development then the project is just not going to pencil at all. It's just you're never going to pencil it. So that means that the, the development won't be built. And so the way to look at this is that the developer is always going to want to hit this optimal density point, but will accept being within this range. It's, uh, you know, the area that we're talking about in terms of hitting the right density count to make sure that people actually build the units that we want them to build. These two areas are infeasible. So from a financial feasibility point, you get above the market price or you get below the area of the land value and the project isn't penciling either because you're getting diminishing returns on the investment. So there's no point in investing more or because the marginal cost doesn't maximize the return on the investment to the point or even meet the, the threshold criteria for getting a return on the investment. That means that the ideal density is between where the marginal cost enters this area of land value, if you will, and where it exits the area of land value. So this is going to vary by, by uh, you know, area. It's going to vary by market. It's going to vary by, by development type. Um, there's lots of detail to this. But I want us to understand this concept that there's a Goldilocks range in density, where if we don't set the density high enough, you're going to be in this region and the projects are going to be infeasible. If you set the density too high, 
let's say eight story buildings are in this range where the marginal cost is never gonna pencil to make that return on the investment, you're never gonna see an eight story building built. But what you will see built is what the market can bear. And so this might be four, this might be five, it might be six story buildings. So if we say to ourselves as a community, we only wanna have four story buildings because we can hit our unit count that we want Unless we are absolutely positive that four-story buildings is not in this region and is instead in this region, we would be making a mistake. Because if four-story buildings is in this region, they will not be built. So that's the main point behind this graphic, and, and I hope I didn't put too many people to sleep there. Okay, so just to recap, housing production can be met with smaller stature buildings, there's absolutely no question about that. And the financial feasibility of projects will be impacted by the development standards. What we set in play as community amenities, what we require in terms of open space, what we require in terms of energy efficiency and all these other things that are of great importance to us in our community all have a financial impact on the projects. And ultimately, unless we develop a code that allows developments to pencil, to make money, to make a return on the investment, those developments will not be built. There's more uh, that I'd like to talk to you about, but I wanted to make sure that we got through some of the features on how form-based code can further ameliorate some of the impacts, some of our biggest fears about what Arcata might look like in the future if we allowed every site to develop out like these glass boxes. That is not the proposal. No one has suggested that. And I understand it's been a little vague in some, uh, some ways, but the next steps as we move through this form gate base code process will further refine these glass boxes to give us a better understanding around how we want to grow as a community. And we're doing that work together. So again, my name is David Loya. I'm the Director of Community Development. I'd like to hear from you. I know the council would love to hear from you as would the Planning Commission. Please reach out to myself or others on my design team uh, in our shop and we'd be happy to speak with you. I wanna remind you that we have many of these resources on our SIRP webpage, that's S-I-R-P. Google that and Arcata and you'll hit our webpage. Uh, we also have many of the uh, videos that we produced on that web page and on our YouTube page. Uh, we're having upcoming engagements to work through the form-based code details and greater uh, refinement with the community and with the decision makers, and we hope to see you there.